welcome to Theorycraft. I'm Ben. Over there is a lovable dude named Jack with two fairy guys called Minogi and Boris. We are two dudes and two fairy little guys that like to rant, rave and ramble all things comic book, sci-fi or just movie lore gone by that has two degrees shaped the movie scope that we have now and some have just utterly flopped. So without further ado, let's start today's topic, which is Labyrinth, the 1986 movie that was at the time declared an absolute flop. I don't know how, because for the past part of, well, as long as I've been around on this planet, I've known it to be an absolute classic. And supposedly Labyrinth, after almost, well, 30 years, give or take, there has been rumours of a sequel for the movie. Now, the premise behind the movie was that there was a girl called Sarah. You never find out what her surname is. She's just literally called Sarah, who's played by Jennifer Connelly. She is a 16-year-old girl who is obsessed with fantasy stuff, lives with her dad and stepmom, but hates her stepmom for random reasons. reasons. Yeah. Hates the fact that she is the babysitter to her little half-brother. And basically, during her obsession with this book that coincidentally is called Labyrinth, which is a play, she decides to say some words from said book to summon the Goblin King to take away the child because she's had enough of him then realises she's completely enough to be fudged up. And... yeah. Now, obviously it sounds a very random plot, but at the same point, this was a very bizarre movie, primarily because it was directed by Jim Henson, who was obviously the mastermind of pretty much all of Hollywood's puppetry since Star Wars, if not earlier. Yeah, for sure. And didn't you also say, didn't he have a part in the in Sesame Street as well, did you say? Yes, he was yeah. the creator of Sesame Street puppets. He was also the creator of the Muppets. But he was also the creator and director to a very obscure movie, which I've not had a chance to watch, but I have been inclined to watch it because of there being a Netflix prequel series called Dark Crystal, which supposedly in some bizarre way, is linked to Labyrinth. Right. But I, again, it's one of these obscure things that I never got a chance to look into because, for whatever reason, I just haven't had a chance to find Dark Crystal. But the thing that I think probably saved this movie most of all was the fact that the Goblin King was played by none other than David Bowie. And while it was a very odd choice to have someone that is purely known as a pop star to play any role in a film, he did it absolutely brilliantly. There was a lot of interesting choice in terms of music. But the thing is, if there is going to be a sequel, this is where we get into an issue because of him passing away... When, when was it? 2016, was it? I think so. It's or, a been little least... bit, or a little bit later than that. I think it was 2016 he passed away, sadly. So it's been about five years, give or take. Yeah. And obviously the whole point is that he is the Goblin King. It's the main point of the movie. So, so... is this thing going to be a sequel or a reboot? Supposedly it's a sequel. Like... In right. the article that I found, it's dated back from last year. It was on Digital Spy. I'll happily put it in the description of this video when it goes live on YouTube. But supposedly it's meant to be a sequel and... <sighs> That's as far as it's got. Like There hasn't been much in terms of how it fits into the previous movie. It's apparently being directed by Scott Durkinson. I don't know if that's how he actually pronounced his name, but he's the guy that was director of the Bermuda Triangle movie, which I've heard really mixed reviews on because it's not 
the best movie for conspiracy stuff, I suppose. But it sounds sounds like it fits into the realm of Sharknado. <laughs> yeah. Um, and by that, I mean the films were rubbish. <laughs> yeah. See, this is why. I got not much hopes in this movie. If it's meant to be coming out next year, and this article was dated last year, and there's been next to nothing about it, it begs the question whether they've actually taken this seriously. Well, say if like, you're going to base like Labyrinth in, like in today's world in 2021, I just found I just think the perfect person to be like a maybe another Goblin King or maybe another interpretation of that. Uh, beloved character that David Bowie played. You have the guy who's been in The Boy From Mars, who's been on Broadway, he's been in The West End, even in The Greatest Showman. Hugh Jackman, I think, would be like really perfect, I think, for that. Yeah, see, this is the thing. It's a very good choice. It's just a very random choice, nonetheless, because... It's, it's just, like, only thing is, do you think like, people would care? Like, now, if you were going to face this film today, do you think people would care about it? not making so much sense because even all this time later i still can't make heads or tails of what the hell the film's about yeah i mean it's a very trippy movie but how are you like how are you gonna make sense of a sequel if you ha still have no idea what the first one was about this is it like the i think the whole point of the movie was that you're supposed to learn from the fact that you can't just run away from your problems. I think that was the whole scope of the thing in some bizarre, trippy... Yeah, it was some moralistic movie where being a teenager, the world's all against you, apparently. I want my freedom, and it's... It's a very bizarre movie. I mean, the thing that is, like, the amount of puppetry that they used in it was just magnificent. Oh, it was I brilliant. I can't, I can't like, doubt that. I mean, the thing, there's a few scenes that always trip me out. There's the bit where, I don't know what they're called, but they look like very stressed out phoenixes. It's like bright orange and bright red firebird type things, and yeah. they can swap body parts. But it's the bit where they like rip their heads, where they pop their heads off and poke their eyes out. It's a bit... <laughs> well, to be honest, I think like even, like, the, even puppetry is a completely lost art. You know, when mm. you had, like, obviously you had Sesame Street, you had Yoda, who was just a, basically a man below a stage, like, controlling this puppet. But now it just seems that is a, that's a lost art in itself. Because this is an art form in itself, using practical effects, using practical puppets. I feel it just gets that, it just gets that more real world vibe, but especially when, if it's going to be... I wouldn't so much have the puppets virtual. I would love them to be physical, real animated puppets. As you know, there's some bits of like of the old magic which I think you can get back, which is I lost think, now. Yeah, I mean the thing is, it's all well and good having CGI, but the problem is with a lot of CGI is that it's so unrealistic sometimes that you can tell that it's not even there. Yeah. And it kind of ruins the movie magic, at least when it's like physically made props, it gives a better illusion to what the story's meant to be. I mean, the thing that I find hilarious is the fact that when it comes to, say, Vision for the MCU, the only thing that he technically wore when he first came about was like a latex mask, and then the entire body was the motion capture shoot, and then over time, obviously, they created the Sue and then they sort of dubbed over it with CGI. And the other thing as well is obviously the art of making props employs so much work because it takes like five people to do one character. Like, say, Big Bird from Sesame Street. It takes two people just to operate him. One's for the head, one's for the body. And then you've got a third person to do the voice. It's a lot of work to just do one character, which employs a lot of people. Even talking about the MCU as well, Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2, when you had Alfred Molina playing Doc Ock, most, the majority of that film, obviously you can tell what CGI and what, you can tell what CGI and what's not, but for a good majority of that film, they used practical real arms. So mm -hmm. you had all together for those four robotic arms, about 20 people on set operating them. <laughs> But this is it, it's 
the thing is with CGI is that while it's amazing how far we've come in terms of special effects, like, it's do you need to use it though. This is it. Like I try to remember there was I can't remember who it was interviewed. There was an actor interviewed for a movie that he'd done once and they basically they had to make him react to like a scene by literally talking to a tennis ball on a stick. Yes, for the hype. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what movie it is. I've got a feeling it's Martin um, Freeman. Is it? And... No, is it... It's not a film where they're talking to like this weird space monkey thingy, is it? I can't remember. I mean... Because there's another one where just. Only thing, it does only thing is, I think the advantage of using puppets is that I've seen so many blunders with CGI. This I can't remember for the life of me what the film's called. But you got one one of the actors who speak into like this space monkey thing that he's holding in his arms. But in reality, all he was doing was just hugging air, basically, and he's like looking in the wrong direction. He's not interacting properly with it. So yeah. it's just unless you're a very good actor. Your performance just doesn't look believable whatsoever. No, I mean the thing is, there are some actors like, say, Andy Serkis, who has done so many different CGI King roles. Kong, Gollum, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, it's like he is one of few actors that has deep dive into the CGI world and learns each time, like how to perform, how to react. But then it's like. I was saying to you about a really sad um, co commentary thing on Lord of the Rings with Sir Ian McKellen, where there's a scene where he's on at the table with all the various characters, and because obviously they're different species, hobbits, dwarves, elves, everything, they're supposed to be shorter than him because he's just a human that's a wizard. Yeah. So they could have easily done a trick where it's called forced perspective, where they basically have an actor further away, but the camera is in such an angle and a straight line that it makes it look like, like say my hands closest to the camera. It looks bigger, even though it's not, but instead what they did is they CGI a green screen and they had all the other actors perform their bit in the actual like uh, room that they made into an actual thing. And then Sir Ian McKellen is CGI'd in a separate room and does all his lines on his own, but they have someone speak the lines to him so he knows how to react. They do the lines, and then as soon as they hit cut, he just bursts into tears because he's so lonely when he acts because he said that's not the point of acting. It's a community. Well, exactly. I mean, Ian McKellen, he comes from that old-school Shakespearean theatre background where, like, you really talk, you really act, you really do all the practical stuff, and it is, you build that kind of community in, like, the West End songs. He was part of that old-school Shakespeare, like, workshop kind of thing. Mm hmm But the other thing that's come across my mind is that, technically, they could get away with not even hiring a big-named actor and just CGI David Bowie over the top. I, but that's a moral thing for me. I like. know, but the thing is, like, before we've had all this lockdown nonsense, there were certain places where you could get, like, hologram concerts of, like, say, Elvis Presley and Roy Orbison. Like that, Michael, and even, yeah, Michael Jackson, Tupac Shakur. But this is where the morality comes in, is, yes, we can do it, but should we do it? Because it's like, well... Like, it's not seeing that actual person. It's seeing an image of that person. I mean, but th you can kind of forgive it to a point where, like, they CGI'd, where, like, in Rogue One, Star Wars, when they CGI'd Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, um, in there, so she looks like a younger self. But mm -hmm. there's certain points where I suppose maybe it's forgivable, but it's a, uh, it's a spin line to walk. I mean, the thing is, with that part for Star Wars, because Rogue One was more about how they got the plans. It wasn't heavily laid into the big scope of Star Wars. It was no. just the blueprints for the Death Star. That was the whole point of it. So it kind of makes sense to have like a minor moment of Carrie Fisher because it lines up to the rest of the saga. Sure. But it was, what, a five-minute scene, give or take? It no, wasn't not much. Even that, like a few seconds. But this is it. Like it doesn't matter for a few seconds. But when it's like a big character 
for like the Goblin King, I just can't see it being fair. Like, no. I mean, the only other actor that I could kind of see getting away with it because he's so good at shape shifting into his roles is Johnny Depp. Ooh. Because he. Because the thing is, when he was doing Sweeney Todd, that was some singing in it as well. So he can sing. And I know, obviously, he's had a bit of issues this past year with getting work. But we're not here to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, and now so and now so is she. But... Yeah, well, it was well-deserved regardless. But there we go. Um, but That's a video for another time. <laughs> I could see Johnny Depp being the Goblin King. And I could see him being more of a sadistic role. Yes, yeah, because I remember, like, I have fond memories watching Sweeney Todd, just seeing, going, the you know, like, the jump, or, and, like, the jump from Cap Captain Jack Sparrow to this sadistic Sweeney Todd character. It's just, the guy's versatile. He can near, pretty much do anything. But this is it. Like, uh, it's so rare to come across someone so versatile because... He's played so many different roles, and yet he's been so unique in each one. Yeah. I mean, the irony is that ev pretty much every single movie he's ever done is with Tim Burton. But I think Tim Burton would probably be a better director as well for something like Labyrinth, because he does very good trippy stuff. Oh, I think so. I mean, the guy's just freaking insane. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> but... The thing is, as well, I don't never don't know whether they should do a continuation in terms of it being a modern day piece and bring in Sarah Connolly again, or whether to do it as like barely a few years after the original one and just recast her by someone who looks similar-ish. Um, I I don't know. I mean, you could. I mean, I think you would have to. I think you would have to bring her back. To be honest, you'd have to bring back at least one of the original characters because it was really only her and david bowie well th that's the thing it's like you barely see the parents because they literally disappear within plus, one scene two main characters there's only one of them left now yeah yeah i mean it's such a bizarre movie regardless i, mean, I don't yeah in the eight in the 80s that's when they were hard into their substances and drink <laughs> well yeah i mean it was the 80s everyone was trying to forget everything from the 70s <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean but, Elvis died that was a sad time uh, it's just there's so many weird analogies within the whole movie itself i mean the thing i there's so many different scenes i love there's like there's a bit where jennifer uh, Sorry, Sarah or Jennifer Connelly falls Jennifer down Connelly. and she has the, that random tunnel full of hands. That's so creepy. And then it forges into the different like faces. But the bit uh, which tripped me out was just I think when she goes into like what she thinks is like a stairwell, but then you see like all these different set of stairs with the baby crawling along the ceiling, the yes. wall, and so on. That tripped me out. <laughs> I love the bit where like you, she's just about to go over the edge, and then you get David Bowie going, Vroom. yeah, and just goes. Uh, <laughs> you can tell it's filmed backwards, but it's such a good aesthetic to do. I just wish I could see how they done it all. You could tell. I think he was like falling onto a mat. I think, and then reversed yeah. it. <laughs> But it's just the thing that I find so funny. I saw a meme a few years ago, and they had a picture of Jared, the Goblin King, and they basically put underneath, "This is where all scene girls got their makeup inspiration from." And it's like, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, it's like the the even funny bit is the baby called Toby is actually called Toby in real life. They like, didn't change his name, which kind of makes sense because. Wouldn't it be cool to see the adult version of that baby? Well, this is what I'm wondering. If they were to like bring it in terms of like modern day, what if it could be like a generational thing where Sarah, either she suppressed the memory somehow or perhaps she's gone back and forth over the decades to... They don't even say where the place is. It's just known as the labyrinth. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> But you could have it as like some weird thing. Maybe she's schizophrenic. 
That would be such a cool twist that it could be oh, like that's, that's going into some like inception stuff like <laughs> Well, it could be like they did. They she's like locked up in an insane asylum. She's declared psychotic or something, and then it's about her trying to prove who she, like everything is real. Because at the end of the, well, the end of the movie is the fact that she basically she's sixteen. She's trying to cling too hard onto being a child, but obviously she's not. She's a teenager. She has to grow up at some point. And all the characters say to her that, should you need us, we'll be there. And then she has a massive party with them all, and that's it. Yeah, and then this is where we find out in the sequel, at the end of the film, she thinks she's in like this place called the Labyrinth, where, as a matter of fact, she's in a robe standing against a white wall in a padded room. <laughs> God. She's been stood there for hours. I don't know what she's on about. <laughs> but the thing is, as well, it's like... <sighs> And wouldn't it be so trippy, like, and wouldn't it be wouldn't it be so trippy if she's a schizophrenic in an insane asylum? Obviously, not trying to glorify mental illness. Let's just put that out there right now. Yeah. Um, but let's just say, like, she's in a room thinking that like this is all playing out in real life, and the doctor walks past, and it's David Bowie. Oh, wouldn't that, that be would trippy? Be as so hell? cool that if only that was possible. Yeah. God, that would be so funny. Because you could have it, you could call him Dr. G. King. That's true, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> but this is it. Like, it's one of few movies that doesn't actually have much of an ending to it, if you think about it. It's kind of, you kind of make it up yourself, really. Yeah, it's. It kind of reminds me of Never Ending Story to a degree, which I think is going to be a video I'm going to have to do another time. But the 80s movies, they seem to be something else. Like, they are quite monumental things, whether it be Terminator, Police Academy, Alien, Predator. They were, they were different. They set the stage for sci-fi or fantasy along the way. But at the same point, it was like it, it. They end, but they don't impact much. And then obviously, different directors come along and they add sequels and make things more complicated. And which screw is up timelines and so on. Yeah, which is why I'm a bit hesitant with the idea of there being a sequel to Labyrinth if it doesn't like have a proper logic to why it's continuing on. If it's a prequel, then yes, that's fine because it gives a bit more depth as to who the Goblin King is, why he is, and what he is. Yeah, but then this is the problem again. Like, can you really do a pre prequel without David Bowie? I don't know. Um, sh this is why, if anything... I could kind of see a sequel where Sarah becomes the Goblin Queen. Mm. But again, it's one of those things like, why? Because they don't explain in the movie what happens to her mum. You assume that her mum must have died. I think because so. Because all you know is like it's her dad and stepmom. Stepmom's not that evil, but it's just the teenage angst towards her being yeah, a stepmom. Yeah, obviously, yeah. But again, there's no actual logic behind any of it. I mean, it's a complete and utter nonsense movie, regardless. But I mean, there's so many random scenes. It's just like there's the weird fox puppet that rides a dog like a horse, and the first thing that comes to my head is Basil Brush. Yeah, that's what I was thinking actually. It's like Basil Brush's pirate brother or something. Yeah, but with with maybe Basil Fawlty's voice. Oh God! <laughs> it's just I the, the one scene that I will kind of find the most peculiar of all is the one where you meet the random hag women with all the stuff stuck to them yes yeah yeah because it's like kleptomania to it type thing where they just basically they can't be without anything so they have to like haul it with them everywhere they go 
and the whole idea is that like she's not able to let go of being a child because she's obsessed with teddy bears. Because that's the whole reason why she wants to get rid of her half brother is because they use one of her many teddy bears for him. So yeah. she's been, that's literally how the movie starts. Is like she's basically she's running back from going out in some random big field or whatever. And she runs home and she can't find this one teddy bear. This one sodding toddy teddy bear that somehow her half-brother's got in his crib. She gets pissed off. She loves the teddy bear more than the child, which I don't understand. But she basically starts reciting this incantation or whatever to summon the goblins to take the child away. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still find it bizarre that they he that he says to her that she's got until the thirteenth hour. It's not the midnight hour; it's the thirteenth hour. Which I'm assuming time goes differently here. Well, he does alter the time because it's like she gets really close, and then he's like, "Right, fuck that." And starts like forwarding the time, so she only has like twenty minutes, which incidentally is how much left of the movie, give or take. But it's one of these things where the whole premise behind the movie is that she's meant to learn that it's more about growing up and obviously actions have consequences. So I can't see how a sequel would work in any way. Like, well, it's kind of one of these things. I put it in the same kind of realm as... E.T. Like E.T. will always be a wonderful standalone film, whereas I think Labyrinth fits into that same thing. Like even Steven Spielberg said that there's no way you can follow up a sequel of E.T. because it can't be better than the first. No, I mean, there's it's some films we... which will always be classics and always stay classics. But it's what we said time and time again on this channel is that. There's been so many movies listed as sequels for the past, well, so many years and still going because Hollywood just doesn't know what to do. They just want to, they have no original ideas left to a degree. If they, like, see a, if they, if they have a cash cow, they will milk that for every penny. Definitely. But it would be quite cool to see something more out of the story but again i just worry that it's more as we said a cash grab and not in terms of plot exactly which i'm sadly seems to be the way it's going but so uh, that's where like like we said before on this channel that i think series is kind of like tv series or should i say streaming series is are turning into the new movies now i feel definitely i mean given the even though Marvel's only doing a mini series for all the different characters, like One Division was only a one hit wonder. There have been some iffy moments in that series, which I will go over at some point, but it has helped build a bit more towards the bigger scope of the universe they've already created. Yeah. And then the same is going to happen with Falcon and Winter Soldier, and the same goes with Loki. Yeah. And the same goes with the Mandalorian series for Star Wars. Like, it doesn't focus on the Jedi or the Sith. It focuses on the little guy that basically gets as a hired gun for the rest of the universe and builds that universe. Yeah, sure. Because I think the original trilogy, it was just heavily laid into the idea of what Jedi and Sith were, like, good and bad, that was it. Prequels came along and they kind of explained what Jedi were, but left the whole idea of the Sith hanging on a thread. And then the newer sequels, they basically scrapped what Jedi meant, scrapped what Sith meant, and just basically went, yeah, we don't have a clue what we're doing. Yeah, and just said, oh, yeah, you know what? Guess what? We're going to do our own thing and just sod what you saw before. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, this is it for today's little rant. What's to well, our next topic is going to be obviously for you to talk about. So, what are you going to talk about for next time? I think the next thing is going to be probably going into sort of real life stories. So, 
Either there could be horrors or other films that say based on true events, as that can be pretty loose for a lot of films, especially because if you put based on true events, everybody will just go, oh yeah, it definitely happened. But yet you have things such as The Exorcist, which that film says entirely based on real life events. Only about 10% of that film actually kind of happened. The other 90% is just fantasy, I'm afraid. Yeah. Because, no. well, because it's Hollywood. If it's not exciting, if it's not thrilling, if it doesn't have a story, a plot, explosions, whatever, you're not going to want to watch it, are you? So you have to take some creative license. So that's what the next episode is going to be about. So take based on a true story with a massive pinch of salt. Definitely. So, again, it's been half an hour, give or take, of me and Jack ranting about movies. Any topics that you guys can think of, please put in the comments down below. Join us on Instagram. We can try our best to message you back if you've got any ideas. And again, stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon. Laters. Oh,